Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to ask and possibly answer the remarkable question, why is everybody hating on Wellington's victory? I'm really baffled. You know, I did a list. The list was uh, the list of uh, 10 composers and their least interesting work. And for Beethoven, I picked the Triple Concerto. And so many of you wrote to me, gee, why didn't you talk about Wellington's victory? I thought you'd pick Wellington's victory. Well, the reason is because Wellington's victory is not Beethoven's least interesting piece of music. But then I got to thinking, what is it about Wellington's victory? Well, part of it is this, and I don't mean to insult anybody, but I, I'm speaking from my own experience. It's this, it's when we get started getting to know Beethoven, we read about this piece of crap that he wrote called Wellington's Victory. And we simply accept that that's what it is. Now, I don't, I'm not going to try and argue that it's, you know, a, a masterpiece on the level of the Seventh Symphony with which it was premiered, by the way. I don't think that, I don't think you have to. The reason I think Wellington's Victory is a much better piece than that, I'll get into in a moment. But first thing I want to point out is facile judgment and parroting of received opinion. Because when I was getting into classical music, I heard Wellington's Victory. I have the best recording, the, the you know, Antal Dorati on Mercury Living Presence, we all know. And I said the same thing. Oh, it's a piece of crap. It's a piece of junk. And there was this smug satisfaction that's so immature. You know, there's this smarminess and, and the ability to say, ooh, Beethoven wrote a piece of junk and I know which one it was. Therefore, I have superior taste because I can pick and choose from what's good and what's garbage. And, and wait, wait, it gets better. Because not only can I tell you that Beethoven wrote a piece of crap and sound oh so terribly smart and, and, and elevated in taste, but Beethoven himself agrees with me. Because when, when the critic Ruchlitz wrote a trashy review of Wellington's victory, Beethoven supposedly exclaimed something like, what I shit is better than his highest thoughts. Well, that's what Beethoven said, and that's what Beethoven felt. There's something very interesting about that comment, though, because everyone has assumed that when he said, what I shit is better than his highest thoughts, that he thought Wellington's victory was a piece of shit. Well, there's no evidence for that. There's no evidence for that at all. In fact, we don't even know if he was talking about Wellington's victory. All he said is, you know, my most worthless piece of junk is better than his best thing. And he, the, the subject that elicited that response was Wellington's victory. But that does not mean that Beethoven classed Wellington's victory with his junk. And I don't think he did. I don't think he did. And I think there's evidence that he did not do so. <clears throat> and the evidence is the score of Wellington's victory. Now we have done this, I've done this once before in another video, but I'm doing this again. I want to read for it to you the preface that Beethoven wrote to Wellington's victory, because it is the only work of his for which we have an extensive, I mean it's a page, a good solid page of performance instructions. Um, and these performance instructions are fascinating because it shows you just how much Beethoven cared about the presentation and that it be done correctly, even for something which was supposedly a populist potboiler. And it is. It is. Yeah, no question about it. But that's, that, as you will see, is not the point. So let's read Beethoven's own notes. I think this is very, very interesting. Are you ready? Here we go. This is translated, thank you, to God, in the Dover edition. Number one, two different wind and brass bands must be used. The first march, Rule Britannia, is played by the first band. The second, Marlborough, played by the second band. In the subsequent movements, both bands play together. Naturally, the rest of the orchestra should be as numerous as possible proportionally. The larger the hall, the more players are wanted. Yes, isn't that interesting? 
go tell that to the people doing their Beethoven cycles with teensy, eensy, tiny, teeny chamber orchestras in enormous concert halls. Ah. Number two, the two bass drums, not large Turkish drums, not large Turkish drums. I um, mean, then there's a footnote about what those are, but that's okay. That produce the effect of cannon shots must be of the largest size. Here in Vienna, they measured five Viennese feet in diameter. The size customarily used in theaters to simulate a thunderclap. The actual Turkish drum belongs solely in an orchestra. In other words, it's not a sound effect. It's an actual bass drum thing. You know, it's the one that you played with cymbals and whatnot, you know, when you had Janissary music, Turkish music. Anyway, they must be located apart from the actual orchestra on opposite sides, one side representing the English army and the other the French army, as the hall permits, but neither one visible to the audience. The conductor who beats time for both sides may, of course, stand in front. Those who play the cannon devices must by no means be right in the orchestra, but at a fair distance. These must be played by very good musicians. Here in Vienna, they were played by the leading conductors. So again, not junk, not crap, is it? Three, the device is called rattles, which represent small arms fire and are customarily used in theaters for the crashing of thunder and for army musket fire itself, must also be play, placed on opposite sides, like the cannons, and close to them. Some specific indications are given for this, but these parts should be assigned to players with sense and taste. The only proviso is that they should never come in right at the outset of a new tempo, except in the presto, a la breve, so that the theme of each tempo is clearly heard. In the charge movement, they don't play at all. And Beethoven also indicated every single musket shot for both sides. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of them. The detail, and Beethoven was a mess when it came to scores, but the detail with which he indicated the the, the, the shooting in Wellington's victory is just unheard of. Number four, the trumpets in E-flat and C are also played on opposite sides, close to the cannonade. Those in E-flat on the English side, those in C on the French side. In addition, four trumpets are located in the orchestra, of which the two trumpets in E-flat and C must be played standing in the orchestra. Five, moreover, there must be two ordinary side drums on each side. Those are snare drums, you know. These players perform a sort of introduction, entree or intrata, on their drums before each march. It should be noted, however, that these intratas mustn't last too long, though longer than the printed music indicates, and wherever possible, they should be placed in the distance and should move closer and closer in order to represent the advance of the troops in a truly realistic manner. Six, with regard to the tempi, the following instructions should be noted. One, the English march not too fast, the French march livelier. The first tempo after the French march moderato, the second subsequent 3-8 slightly slower still. In the charge, it's a good idea to take the tempo gradually a little faster and faster. The final tempo, 6-8 andante, not too fast. Number two. In the Victory Symphony, which is what happens at the end, the entrada not too fast, the second tempo in common time, very lively. The final tempo, which is 3-8, not too fast, almost allegretto. Where there is an indication that only two first violins, two second violins, two violas, and two cellos are to play, in a larger hall, it's all right for three or four of each to play, but with the best performers for each part. Seven, it is very necessary that in the orchestral performance, uh, in addition to the concertmaster, a conductor should beat time for the whole ensemble. That was a new thing. To both of them, it is recommended to keep the overall effect in mind at every moment so that the instrumental music is not overpowered by the rattles, drums, or other devices. Generally speaking, the proportions of the hall, the size of the orchestra, and the ratio of these factors must govern the conducting. Eight. In the Victory Symphony, there are also two wind and brass bands, but the second band doesn't play in piano or solo passages. Vienna, December 1815, Ludwig van Beethoven. 
So, does that sound like the guy believed it was a piece of crap? That it was worthless? And why are we so happy to say so? Why are we just mindlessly jawing with received opinion? Well, first of all, if you listen to it, it is noisy. It is a pot boiler, a shameless pot boiler, but it's not a bad piece of music. And the reason it isn't is because it's honest. Listen to what Beethoven wrote. Look at what he said about it. He wanted it to be exactly what it purports to be and to be the best at it. And if you're the best at anything, as H.L. Mencken said, just competence at anything from adultery to zoology, Beethoven was an enormously successful composer at writing a popular pot boiler. And so it is not his least interesting work. Actually, it's one of his most successful. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. And it does it in smart fashion, in perfect time, with not a note out of place or a note too long, with every detail carefully considered. And I think that makes it a fine work of its type. It's not the greatest piece of music in the world. We don't have to say that. But we don't have to just, you know, diss it like we're smart people because we can diss it. I mean, that doesn't make you smart at all. That makes you a, a witless lemming, actually. So that's that. The other point I want to make about Wellington's victory, I mean, it's a precursor to other works such as the 1812 Overture, which has exactly the same pluses and minuses you know, as Wellington's victory does, right? Tchaikovsky said it's very noisy, he hated it, etc., etc. It's fabulous. We all think so, right? Don't we? So the reason I chose the triple concerto and not Wellington's victory as Beethoven's least interesting composition is because it's not an honest work in the way that Wellington's victory is. It is a, a concerto that you would think, because of Beethoven's other concertos, is going to be radical, revolutionary, incredibly expressive, impressive in all kinds of ways, and it isn't. Is it bad? No, it's workaday. And the, Beethoven is never workaday, and Wellington's victory is not workaday. And the other myth that I want to end with, another thing that just sort of bothers me that people mindlessly parrot about Wellington's victory, is that it was Beethoven's most popular piece of music in his lifetime. We say that so that so that we can also smirk at the horrible taste of audiences in Beethoven's day. Ha, 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 aren't we more elevated than they were? Let's, let's be clear. There isn't any evidence that it was the most popular piece of music, of Beethoven's music in his lifetime. The most popular piece, as far as I always understood, was his septet, which also annoyed him because he thought he wrote many more profound pieces. But just think about how, how stupid that statement is. First of all, what does popularity mean in the day before the days before broadcasting or recordings? It means people had to go see it. Well, how often do you think people could go see it? The piece requires enormous forces. It's extremely complex and and you know from a logistical point of view and expensive. So yes, certainly it was popular. In other words, people liked it. People went to see it. That's true. But just just think for a minute. The most popular piece by Beethoven had to be either chamber music or solo piano music or something where people could buy the music and play it at home. That's what they did. And that is what popularity meant. Not, you know, how many people you could squish into one of these tiny halls in the days before deodorant and toilet paper where the body odor alone would have made you pass out. I mean, the, 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 the things that people repeat and say with, with I would add, you know, the, the, the smugness and arrogance of believing that they have some sort of special knowledge that's going to impress other people. And of course, the most depressing thing is that it often does impress other people. But all of that's nonsense. So I'm not saying you have to like Wellington's victory. I'm not saying you have to believe it's a great work of art or that it's great music. It is what it is. But let's at least acknowledge what it is and what Beethoven thought about it and give credit where credit's due. That's my only point. And by those criteria, it is far 
from his least interesting work. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.